H. H. Scott, American company that designed and manufactured high-quality audio equipment, including amplifiers, tuners, and receivers. The firm played an important role in the formation of the hi-fi industry. American engineer Herman Hosmer Scott founded the firm H. H. Scott, Incorporated in 1947 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The initials H.H. in the name were chosen to avoid confusion with an older firm, E.H. Scott Radio Laboratories of Chicago. Prior to starting his own company, Scott obtained a degree in classical engineering and had a career of more than 15 years with General Radio. In 1946, he set up Technology Instrument Corporation, which produced its first product, the Type 910, a tube dynamic noise canceller for radio stations. This device was effective in clearing crackles and noise from recordings. On the wave of success of this invention in 1947, the company H. H. Scott was born. The business was originally housed in an old shoe factory in Cambridge. The first products of H. H. Scott immediately demonstrated an innovative approach. The very first commercial product was the so-called Dinaural Noise Suppressor, designed to filter out the noise of gramophone records. This device was originally aimed at the professional radio industry and for the first time made it possible to put on the air records without the characteristic crackles and clicks. In fact, Scott's invention revolutionized radio. Thanks to the noise suppressor, radio stations in the USA were able to gradually replace many live concerts with pre-recorded music. Dinaural noise suppressor models were continually improved and produced until 1956, when the last version, Model 114A, was discontinued. In addition to broadcast radio equipment, even in the early years of the company's existence, Scott was already involved in the development of high-quality consumer audio equipment. In the late 1940s, the 210A was launched, one of the first integrated hi-fi amplifiers for home use. This 30-watt monaural amplifier, with built-in phono stage, was intended for playing records and became the prototype of the subsequent Scott 200 series amplifiers. It is important to note that Scott did not initially intend to limit himself to a narrow niche. He licensed his noise-canceling technology to other manufacturers. In the early years, Dinaural Noise Suppressor was installed in devices from a number of companies, including the competing Fisher Radio. However, Scott soon decided to independently produce complete audio components with built-in noise cancellation. Thus the firm H.H. H. Scott entered the high-end consumer audio market. In the early 1950s, the H.H. H. Scott continued to innovate its products and expand its range of models. A complex system of categorizing models was introduced, numbers 100 for preamplifiers and control units, 200 for power amplifiers and integrated amplifiers, 300 for radio tuners, 400 for measuring equipment, and so on. In 1952, the Scott 99A integrated amplifier was introduced. It was the first unit with horizontally arranged tubes, which reduced the height of the cabinet and gave it a flat profile. The marketing name of the model, 99, was chosen for a reason. It corresponded to the price of the device, only $99, which was emphasized in advertising as an affordable price for a real hi-fi. The Scott 99 was extremely successful. It was modernized several times and remained in production until 1964, becoming one of the company's most popular amplifiers. Scott's main contribution to audio technology in the 50s was tuners. The company's chief engineer, Daniel R. von Recklinghausen, played a key role in the development and popularization of FM radio as a standard of high sound quality. As early as 1954, Scott introduced the first commercial broadband FM tuner, the Model 310A, which had significantly more bandwidth and linearity than early VHF receivers. Scott tuners quickly gained audiophile acceptance, 
and FM radio was finally established as the premier format for broadcasting high-quality music. By the middle of the decade, the firm had grown considerably. In 1957 it moved from the old Cambridge building to a new modern factory with a laboratory complex in the suburb of Maynard, Massachusetts. The product range expanded. In addition to amplifiers and tuners, Scott established a measurement technology division, the so-called instrument division, and began producing precision instrumentation for acoustic laboratories. The first Scott-branded sound sources also appeared. For example, in 1955 the company introduced its own turntable, Model 710A, an unusual high-class machine for those times. In general, H.H. H. Scott's 1950s gear was in the upper price segment. For example, the powerful Model 280 monoblock amplifier, 80 watts, 1956, was selling for $199 and the 310B tuner for $159, equivalent to about $800 and $700 in 1980s prices. Despite the considerable cost, these devices found customers because of their advanced features and impeccable brand reputation. The late 1950s marked the audio industry's transition from mono to stereo. The first commercial stereophonic records and tape recorders appeared between 1957 and 1958, and Scott was among the leaders of this new revolution. Already in 1958, the company launched a line of components under the name StereoMaster, introducing the Scott 299 Integrated Stereo Amplifier. A year later, separate stereophonic components were introduced. In 1959, the first Scott 130 stereo preamplifier and stereo power amplifier debuted, along with special adapters that allowed existing mono systems to be upgraded to stereo. The name Stereo Master quickly became synonymous with high-end stereo, and demand for Scott products continued to grow at the turn of the decades. In 1961, regular stereophonic FM broadcasting was officially launched in the USA, and Scott was again ahead of the market. Even before the standard was approved, the company was involved in testing the FM multiplex stereo system with Boston radio station WCRB, one of the first in the country to begin experimental stereo broadcasts. The engineers, led by von Recklinghausen, had the foresight to design and test decoders for all four stereo systems in question, trying to unify them as much as possible in terms of components. When the Federal Communications Commission FCC, announced the selection of a single standard, the Zenith GE system, on the 19th of April 1961, the H.H. H. Scott Company was fully prepared to jump in. Scott was ready for the big leap. The company was the first on the market to sell both special FM stereo adapters for existing receivers and fully functional FM stereo tuners. The first production model was the Scott 350, launched in 1961, which made history as the first commercially available FM tuner in the US with stereo multiplex support. Thanks to advanced purchasing of components, Scott's factory was able to build about 1,000 stereo decoders immediately after the FCC's decision, which were immediately shipped to radio stations and shops across the country. The next step was the Scott 296 tube amplifier, 1963, which was improved over its predecessors not only with increased power but also with an output for additional speakers, a center for the summed signal, such features were ahead of their time. The devices remained expensive, but the public was willing to pay for real sound. The company prospered, successfully combining the introduction of new technologies with traditional build quality. By the way, even before the final standard of FM stereo, Scott engineers offered temporary solutions. For example, Scott 399 receiver, released around the end of 50s, allowed to simultaneously receive one program channel on FM and the other on AM thus reproducing stereo sound from two synchronous radio frequencies. Such experiments confirmed the firm's status as a technical innovator. In 1964, 
H. H. Scott was one of the first in the industry to produce an all-transistor stereo receiver, all stages using semiconductors instead of tubes. Two years later, in 1966, Scott became the first hi-fi manufacturer to use FETs in the high-frequency stages of FM tuners, which significantly increased receiver sensitivity and reduced noise levels. At the same time, the company developed the first integrated circuits. One of the models of the late 60s was a receiver made almost entirely on silicon microcircuits, without a single electron vacuum tube. In 1967, the company expanded its range with a number of new transistor amplifiers and receivers in the StereoMaster series, for example, the Scott 348, and introduced its own loudspeakers, the Scott S11 range in 1967 and the S12 in 1968. And in 1969 Scott surprised the market again by developing one of the first quartz stabilized receivers, the prototype of future digital frequency synthesizers. At the same time, the company also offered self-assembly kits, for example, the LR88 model was a stereo receiver constructor aimed at radio electronics enthusiasts. Despite the technical successes, closer to the 70s the position of American hi-fi firms like Scott began to weaken. The market was flooded by progressively more technologically advanced and inexpensive Japanese amplifiers and receivers, and the transistor era lowered the entry barrier for new competitors. Scott was faced with a choice, either withdraw into the niche of exclusive expensive premium equipment, as, for example, Macintosh did, or try to compete for the mass consumer with the industry giants of Japan. The management chose the second path, to try to increase production volumes and make the equipment more affordable without sacrificing the famous features of Scott. Unfortunately, this strategy only delayed the problems, and the quality and reliability of some new models decreased, which had a negative impact on the brand image. H. H. Scott actually began to lose the competition with such corporations as Sony and Pioneer, trying to outdo them in their own field of mass-produced equipment. Between 1967 and 1968, the company stopped producing tube models altogether and switched to transistors. It also tried to keep up with the new trends. For example, in the early 1970s the catalog included a quadraphonic amplifier, model StereoMaster 499, and other equipment for then popular quadro sound. But these efforts could not stop the gradual decline in sales and profits by the turn of the decade. The early 1970s were a difficult period for H. H. Scott. Intensified competition and price pressures led the company into serious financial difficulties. In October 1972, experiencing a shortage of capital, H. H. Scott was forced to stop production. In November 1972, Several creditors filed for involuntary bankruptcy, and Scott initiated reorganization proceedings. It is remarkable that it was in 1972 that the founder of the company, 63-year-old Herman Scott, retired, handing over the reins of management and actually leaving his brainchild on the threshold of crisis. Nevertheless, the brand was saved from total extinction. In January 1973, the assets of H. H. Scott was acquired by the Belgian firm Saima International, Brussels, a European licensee and long-time distributor of Scott products. Already in February 1973, the new owner resumed production at the Maynard plant. The headquarters and engineering department soon moved closer to Boston. Between the end of 1975 and the end of 1976, the company moved its operations from Maynard to Woburn, Massachusetts. There was also a change of key persons. Technical director Daniel von Recklinghausen left his post to become a consultant for Electro Audio Dynamics, EAD, in 1973. Thus, by the mid-70s, the company H. H. Scott was fully controlled by a foreign investor, although its products were still designed and partly manufactured in the USA. Under the management of Saima, the Scott range was updated in line with the trends of the time. Loudspeakers, including the Copley range of the late 70s, were reintroduced, amplifiers and receivers were given a modern look with silver panels, and marketing emphasized high technology. 
In the mid-70s, for example, the Scott T33S tuner was introduced, one of the world's first FM tuners with digital frequency synthesis, PLL. This model anticipated the industry's move to digital tuning and showed that Scott engineers were still able to compete in innovation. In general, equipment in the late 70s covered a wide range of segments, from inexpensive A-series integrated amplifiers, like the Scott A416, to solid-state receivers, like the Scott R77S with 60 watts per channel. Despite all efforts, the former glory could not be returned. The products of the late 1970s no longer had the impeccable sound quality for which the tube models of the 50s and 60s were renowned, and were perceived more as a reliable average class against the backdrop of increasingly sophisticated Japanese systems. The company tried to stay in the market, making a bet on export. For example, in 1977, Scott amplifiers of American assembly were sold in Switzerland with an unprecedented, for that time, three-year warranty. Buyers were even given a plastic personalized warranty card in the format of a credit card. In the 1980s, the legendary name H.H. H. Scott finally changed ownership and actually left the big leagues of the audio industry. In 1985, the H.H. H. Scott was acquired by Emerson Radio Corporation, an American manufacturer of mass-produced consumer electronics. The new owner decided to use the promoted brand on its inexpensive equipment, counting on name recognition. From that moment on, products under the Scott logo were no longer developed by the former engineering team and were no longer in the audiophile segment. In the late 1980s, the Scott brand was mainly used to produce budget receivers, stereos, and OEM CD players. For example, the early Scott CD players received good reviews due to the use of high-quality digital-to-analog converters, Burr-Brown, and high parameters for their time. Nevertheless, such equipment no longer had anything in common with the classic hi-fi that the company was famous for in the middle of the 20th century. At the end of the 90s, the brand H.H. H. Scott practically disappeared from the market. The Emerson Company, which owned the rights to the brand, gradually phased out the production of products under this name. The marketing value of the old audio brand decreased as generations of consumers changed. The Scott brand formally remained a division of Emerson, but does not really operate in the field of high-quality audio. Thus, the history of the independent company H.H. H. Scott actually ended in the 1980s. Despite the sad ending, H.H. H. Scott left an indelible mark on hi-fi history as one of the pioneers of the post-war audio industry. H.H. H. Scott products still serve as reference standards. Together with competitors of that time, Fisher, Marantz, Macintosh, H.H. H. Scott helped to create the culture of high-quality home sound. Well, another video has come to an end. Thank you for watching it. Support the channel by liking, subscribing, commenting and other available features. Until the next video.